thing. To be humble means to have God be your author. To have nothing left in your mind but the presence of God. To let go of opinions, conclusions, all fears, doubts, and all pride. And then you come into an absolute humbleness. But there's a strength in this humbleness. It's not a weak humble at all. It's a very strong <laughs> humble. <laughs> it's the strongest humble imaginable. <laughs> so, I said the world was backwards and upside down. And what that means is that, as Jesus says in the Course, the real world is not like the world that you perceive. The linear world. There are no artificial lights to light the streets. Uh, there are no buildings in the real world. Uh, there are no stores in the real world. No shopping in the real world. That's a pretty significant difference right there. Uh, <laughs> no shopping. Uh, we're talking about the real world is, is the happy dream. It's the forgiven world. It's true perception. It's the borderland that Jesus talks about. And everything that seems valuable in this world is not actually valuable at all. It's kind of like this world is like a house of cards. And when I say this world, I'm using the analogy of linear time. That's really what I mean by this world. And when I talk about the real world, I'm talking about the world perceived from the present moment. A forgiven world where everything is simultaneous and nothing comes before anything else. Where everything is completely equal and, and completely connected because it's all unified in the moment. Linear time distorts uh, everything and things, you know, what is valuable in this world? Well, money is valuable in this world and in the real world there is no money. Um, education is valuable in this world, certainly, and in the real world there's no education. It's more like a Zen moment, <laughs> the Holy Instant. There's just nothing that qualifies. In this world, um, status is important, uh, credentials are important, um, and you could say the body is important in, in this linear world. You know, the body is like the hero of the dream. When we watch our fairy tales, you know, what would the fairy tale be without the heroine or the hero? Uh, what would a sporting match be without any heroes? Imagine your favorite basketball teams or football teams and then no importance and no heroes. No competition, no winning, no losing, uh, nothing, the, the body in the, in the real world, it's nothingness is very obvious, so there's, there's nothing to improve with it. You don't have to worry in the real world about being fat or skinny, about being young or old, uh, cardiovascular fitness, uh, nothing. Um, uh, you know, your, uh, uh, all the things that are concerned with the, the body and, and the levels of nutrition and everything that, that is really exemplified and held out in this world is to be epitomized, to be followed, you know, eating from the five food groups and, and having the right foods, and there's a lot of enormous effort and energy is put in thought into these things. Yeah. You know, there's none of it in the real world. When you actually start to contemplate this, you can start to see that when Shakespeare said the world is much ado about nothing, he was speaking of linear time. He was really saying that linear time doesn't amount to anything. And, and if you start to get a hint that all these things that seem valuable in the ego's linear world, which it invented, which is fictitious, once you start to see that those aren't really valuable, it just gives your mind an invitation to begin to rest. Be still and know that I'm God. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a leaning inward towards going inward and realizing that you can actually start to devalue or let go of those things. That you're not going to be left behind anybody because there's no body to be left behind. That you're not going to fall behind in the game because the game's not real. You're not going to die even. You know, that's the thing that keeps the, the, 
this plate spinning and, and the world going is this belief that without all these things, I would be nothing, I would, it would be boring, um, and it would be death. It would be death of the familiar self that I've known in this world and death of the world that surrounds that familiar self. So you see that the Holy Spirit has a major convincing job to do. Because what the ego made, it not only made a substitute for the Kingdom of Heaven, but it made up a false self and a false world, and it made this world alluring. If this make-believe substitute world was only pain, only suffering, it had nothing else but trauma, it wouldn't be so hard to drop. You probably would drop it faster than a hot potato. It would be really easy to drop. Be like, mm, no thank you. You want the world? Not. Not. It would be very easy. But the ego made a lot of aspects of its linear world very, very alluring. And where do you think we get a word, like from the Bible, called temptation? If, if you saw the world for what it was, there would be no temptation. Hmm, heaven, eternal life, or duality. The pains and pleasures, including health, sickness, including life, death, its own version of life, death, which is the body. In some cultures, you know, they, they celebrate birth and they mourn death. There are very rare cultures that, that celebrate death and mourn birth, <laughs> like being born into another, another cycle of, of karma. But if you just begin to get this larger context I'm talking about, then your life can kick into high gear of being a miracle worker. Because as you open up to miracles, that's where the miracles are going to take your mind. On the ride of a lifetime, ending up in peace, stillness, non-judgment, acceptance, total acceptance, very relaxing. You, you know, you can just feel, oh, how relaxing. Let go of the mortal fuss, because it's not mortal at all. Life, eternal life doesn't have a beginning or an end, and so if we really give ourselves over to miracle working and forgiveness, then we, we settle down into that, ah, love lift us up to where we belong. Bring us back to that natural state of heaven that we were created in perfect oneness and that, that we will never be satisfied with anything less. So, for me, you could say that the journey is always for our own awakening, but as the Course says um, that how many teachers of God does it take to save the world, it just takes one. But that one is not a body, or in a body. So even very well-meaning Christians who will say, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, if they think of Jesus as a man, or as a body, or as a historical figure, that's not the Savior of the world, because in the Course we learn that the Savior is not a body or in a body. It's literally a mind that has accepted its wholeness. And therefore, Jesus, even the historical Jesus, is just a symbol of that mind. Before Abraham was, I am. I and the one, I and the Father are one. That, that's a symbol of that vast acceptance. So, even the Course says, his little life on earth, you know, was just, was not enough to, to teach the this massive lesson that's really a lesson of resurrected mind. If you just took those brief years on earth of Jesus, it's hard to of perfect oneness. Again, it seems like another little story and parable, and, and even nowadays there are people who, who doubt that Jesus even lived and walked on the earth. When you think, three years out of, out of millenniums to teach perfect divine oneness. It's, it's just like a little skit. And, uh, and some people have forgotten the skit. Some people don't believe the skit ever occurred. And in the ultimate sense, it didn't. Uh, because time and space are, 
are all part of the ego's delusion. And we have to learn to, in the end, forgive history. We have to accept the present moment so completely and allow it to take us as a gateway back into eternity that we actually are willing to question history, all of history. We're willing to, to say, I'm not going to look to history to find my answers. I'm going to look for that small, still voice within me to lead me to the answer that I am one with God and that I am one with everything. That's a big opening, you know, that, that's a whole new context for life on planet Earth. And for me it's been, that's been the journey, is letting go of everything I thought I knew about everything. Letting go of all opinions, letting go of, of being right about any perception in the world. Any limited perception in the world and opening to the vast perception of forgiveness. It's real. It's, you might say it's not real in terms of eternity, but it's the only illusion that leads out of all the others. And so, when you devote your life to learning forgiveness as taught by Jesus in the Course in Miracles, you're really devoting yourself to the one illusion that leads out of all the rest. That in heaven there is no forgiveness, because there's nothing to forgive. Heaven is perfect oneness, but in terms of multiplicity, in terms of linear time, heaven is out of awareness, but forgiveness is, is our goal. Is really the one goal that we is worthy of our mind. And that's